Well, good evening, everyone. It is six o'clock, and so we are going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank you for joining us uh, tonight for our restart, for our responsible restart parent webinar. So we're going to be re re uh, reviewing some uh, information we originally shared in July uh, with some updates that have happened uh, just over the last number of weeks as we plan for our return to the all-in option for the school-based pathway on March first. So, Andy, if you go to the next slide for me. So this evening, a number of us will be sharing uh, information with you and or answering questions. And so uh, thrilled to be joined by Andy and Jacqueline and Chris. Um, I think most people are used to this by now, but you can type your questions into the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, and then we will be uh, answering those as time allows at the end of the presentation. We're gonna try to move through our presentation quickly so we can spend as much time as possible on your questions. And so our agenda for the evening uh, is to do an overview of all-in learning, focus on the health and safety of precautions. Also want to provide an overview of the online academy. I uh, want to talk about how to request a change in your child's learning pathway. And then, of course, we will go right into the Q&A. Uh, there, there will be an additional webinar this evening for high school families beginning at 7.15, and I want you to know that building principals are gonna be sharing more information uh, via a series of videos about school day procedures and you will be receiving those via email. So tonight, as we walk through the information, it'll be at the district level and you will be receiving specific information at the building level uh, very, very soon. So uh, as we've talked about throughout the entire pandemic, uh, everything that we're sharing with you tonight is certainly subject to change based upon changing uh, conditions, guidance from public health, uh, or the scientific community, or certainly work with our medical advisory team. Uh, also, always want to be uh, clear that uh, we could always look at closures of classrooms, schools, or the entire district uh, due to positive COVID-19 uh, cases. And so, um, also keep in mind, and this happened in December, uh, if we have issues staffing one or more of the buildings, uh, we could also have to revert to a different learning model for the school-based pathways. But none of those things are our goals, but we always just want to remind folks of the possibilities. And so this next slide is one uh, that you've seen a number of times, obviously two pathways uh, for the year. Uh, tonight, we're going to spend most of our time talking about the school-based all students everyday path or all in as we've taken to calling it uh, with a bit of time spent on the online academy as well. So going uh, to the next slide. And so this is the option that we're gonna be transitioning to beginning on March 1st. Uh, so all students in the school-based pathway are gonna be attending school in person every day, all day uh, with the health and safety uh, per per precautions we're gonna be mentioning in just a few moments and we've talked about throughout the year. Uh, we are gonna be striving for as much physical distancing as possible. Our goal is certainly going to be three, three feet, but that's not going to be possible in many situations, uh, especially within our classrooms. We will be talking more specifically about lunch, which will have a different standard. Uh, and Mr. Potts will be covering that in just a few minutes. Next slide, Andy. And so these are a number of things, and I don't need to walk through uh, each of these, but I do want to highlight just the continued importance of face masks and face coverings. Uh, one of the things I am incredibly proud of our students and staff in the school-based pathway, they have done a great job with wearing masks and wearing masks properly. Uh, we've had very few issues with that, and, and that is a big part of our ability now to be able to transition to the all-in pathway. Uh, I just wanted to highlight as well, uh, again, you can see all the things on this list, but even as we transition to all-in, we're still not going to be allowing visitors or volunteers in the build buildings just to limit the capacity as much as possible. Uh, this is, uh, our next slide is very important and we're getting a lot of questions about this and we should be getting uh, a, a lot of questions. As we all know, the end of the school year uh, is a special time and there are many milestone celebrations at the different levels uh, with certainly the culminating event uh, being high school uh, graduation uh, or, or, or commencement. So I'll talk about that and then I'm gonna talk about some of the other celebrations as well. 
I do want you to know that we intend to offer an in-person graduation option for the class of 2021. Um, I also want you to know it's not going to be at the Schottenstein Center. Uh, Ohio State has already reached out to us and let us know that their facility is not going to be available uh, due, uh, due to their uh, specific COVID protocols. And so we're going to be look, looking and working with public health officials to offer an in-person option for our students, likely using our stadium. Uh, and so we're going to make sure the student voice is obviously key in, in planning that event. Uh, and you'll be hearing more about that as the high school team is working with the class of 2021 to begin that. But obviously there are a lot of other uh, ceremonies uh, as we end uh, in activities, as we uh, near the end of the year. And so we're gonna be working at all levels on all of those uh, to find as many uh, safe ways to hold those ceremonies as possible while still following all of the health and safety protocols. So again, uh, stay, uh, stay tuned but just wanted our parents and students to know that those are very important to us and we are making plans for those events. So if we go to the next slide, we wanna start talking about health and safety uh, pre 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 precautions. Um, it is very important that our families continue to do the daily symptoms checks at home with your students. Um, and if they're exhibiting any of the symptoms uh, you see uh, there, uh, we need to keep those, those, uh, those, those students home. Uh, certainly if they're experiencing any of those symptoms at school, they're gonna be moved to a supervised area uh, and you're gonna hear from us. And so those students can be uh, picked up uh, promptly. So again, this is just very important to continue monitoring for all of these symptoms at home. Uh, and if your student is, is experiencing any of these symptoms, we ask you uh, to keep your student home. So now we're gonna move into the next slide. Um, and I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes here because I will tell you uh, that since we announced our plans to return to All In on March 1st, we have had many, many people reach out and wanna talk about quarantine uh, and what the guidance is and what are the rules we are following uh, and uh, how does that impact kids? And we've had a lot of specific questions uh, over the last number of days, specifically about students in extra curriculars uh, or in athletics for the spring. And so let me talk to you about where we are and where I think we are going in these areas. Um, and so um, obviously if a student tests uh, test positive, uh, they are placed into isolation. Uh, and I think we all uh, know that. So I'm gonna spend again time talking about quarantine. Uh, so if we uh, have a student who is a close contact of another person who, have ha who has tested positive, uh, then they do need to quarantine. And so the current guidance from public health is a close contact is defined um, as someone who has been within six feet of someone who has tested positive for a cumulative total uh, of 15 minutes or more during the, the, the day. Um, and if a person does meet that, uh, that, uh, that criteria, whether a student or adult, uh, then they are placed uh, into quarantine for 10 days. Um, now, here's where it gets a bit complicated. Uh, if you were near someone who tested positive and that happened within a classroom, you are on quarantine uh, for everything outside of the school day, but you are allowed to continue to come to school only during, during that quarantine period. But you cannot uh, do anything outside of the school day. And if you're an athlete, the, the current guidance is uh, that you would be quarantined for 14 days. And let me pause there for a moment and let you know that I learned just this afternoon, and so this is late breaking news, in a conversation I had with the Lieutenant Governor, John Husted, that the uh, state is considering uh, changing and the county is, is considering changing the quarantine guidance to align with CDC recommendations, which even for ath 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 athletics would be a 10 day quarantine and you would be able to come back uh, after seven days with a negative test if you've had that test uh, at least five days after, after you were exposed. 
Um, and so I was uh, thankful that the Lieutenant Governor shared that with us. And we will look forward uh, to that update coming out from public health officials. And as soon as we have that, we will certainly share that with all of our families. Um, but, the, but the current guidance is uh, 10 days, uh, except for sports, and that is 14 days. Uh, and if you were exposed in the classroom, you can continue coming to the classroom and to the classroom only. So I wanna be really clear there. I know we've gotten lots of questions about sports. Um, and so let me just say it again. If you are exposed to COVID and you are an athlete, the current guidance is 14 days. But again, we are looking uh, to guidance that is gonna be coming out very soon uh, that is going to change that to 10 days or seven days with a negative test uh, that has been uh, after day five. Um, and again, I wanna thank the, the Lieutenant Governor for taking the time to talk this afternoon uh, and for sharing that. Um, and so a number of people again have asked a lot of questions about this and so wanted to be clear on that. So if you're exposed in the classroom, you are going to be allowed to continue coming to school, which is great news for the for the continuity of, of, of education. Um, but again, you will still need to quarantine outside of the classroom. Now, if you're exposed outside of the classroom, let me be clear on that. If you're exposed outside of the classroom, you will still uh, have to quarantine and will not be able to actually come to school during that time period. So say for instance, uh, in the home, uh, someone in my home uh, tests positive and I'm a close contact due to someone in my home, um, I will be on quarantine and will not be able to come to the, the, the classroom for the school day. Uh, but if I am a close contact within the, the school day, I will be able to continue coming to the classroom. And so I'll ask you to be putting, and I'm sure you already are, to be putting your questions about quarantine into the Q&A and we'll make sure that we carve out time and spend as much time as you would like on quarantine um, as we, as we move in uh, to that part of the evening. So if we'll go to the next uh, slide, uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hatton, who's gonna talk about how we're gonna maintain continuity of education for students who are on quarantine and are not able to come to school, Dr. Hatton. Thanks, Paul. So with um, the considerations that Paul just shared uh, around quarantine, and the fact that um, it is zero to six feet uh, treated equally, and the fact that um, students will be, if there is an in-school exposure, they're gonna continue to come to school. And if we can get those other pieces in place, it is our assumption because of the mitigating factors that we have uh, going on in our schools, which are very good, that we would hopefully have very few actual students out of school on quarantine. But so with that in mind, the way we're gonna start off is that we're gonna treat these like we have with extended absences in the past. Um, we've done this for a long time in education uh, and our teachers do a great job with it. So basically we're gonna uh, have teachers work with those uh, students on a case by case basis. You know, in the elementary school, it would be uh, email, it would be working through Seesaw or Canvas and uh, keeping the child caught up through engagements, uh, through our learning management system. Same thing in our middle school and high school, case by case basis, continue to keep the child um, caught up with their academics by staying engaged in Canvas, communicating with the teacher through email and working with the counselor and, uh, and at the middle school level, the team of teachers uh, to have a successful reentry plan when that quarantine is over. At this time, um, we're gonna shift over to some of the safety protocols and the general rules for face coverings. And uh, Mr. Chris Potts is gonna take it over from here. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, so just updating um, where we are on our general safety rules, um, which many of you I know have seen. Um, just some, some quick things as it relates to face coverings. And as Paul indicated earlier, um, the students and staff have done an amazing job with face coverings and we know they will continue to do that as our medical team advises that is one of the most important mitigating factors that we can do is is to make sure we're wearing face coverings appropriately. 
Um, so a couple of things on this slide. One, um, you'll see gators are not to be used. That is being recommended by our medical advisory team. Um, oftentimes those gators are very thin in nature um, and easily drop down below the, the nose and mouth. And so our medical advisory team has advised us to in, in not allowing those. So um, just an update there on gators. Uh, the second thing that we would just recommend to all to all parents um, is that throughout the day, things happen with masks, right? And we are going to have um, plenty of, of, of spares on hand for situations where they're forgotten or um, something happens at recess that they fall off, et cetera. Um, but we, we really would encourage parents to put, you know, one or two extra in, in the backpack every day with, with your child. Um, so if something does happen, they're able to, you know, put, put a new mask on right away. But again, we will have extras available, both child and student sizes um, at all of our schools, but want to make sure, you know, we're, we're all thinking ahead and, and packing some extras. As we move on to the next slide. Let's see here. There we go. Um, we're going to dig into lunch here. And, you know, each each individual building will will be sharing, as Paul indicated, um, about certain protocols in every building as it relates to um, arrival and dismissal, recess, um, lunch in their building. But uh, as a general rule, you know, for the elementary students, they're going to go back to, re to ordering their lunches each morning like they have in the morning. So pre-orders aren't going to continue with the elementary students. Um, the lunch line will be open for students to go through and pick up their lunches. Um, they won't be providing their lunch number um, any longer. They're just, it's, we're just going to be doing a lunch count. Um, they're going to be spread out, whether it's between the cafeteria and the classrooms. Um, so the most important thing as it relates to lunch that our medical team has advised us is keeping that six feet when the masks are off. So whether we're at elementary, middle, or high, um, all the that is being accomplished with, with, within the building. Now, as the weather breaks, we, we are going to be providing some tents at the middle school and high school as an extra area to, to break outside and, and eat lunch outside for certain, certain, um, for certain schools, but the, but the principals will be working with, with kids on, on the use of those tents. Um, I will tell you that we're also going to be using three compartment um, containers so as kids are going through the lunch line and then maybe walking back to their classroom to eat um, or having a safe transportation of the food. Um, and then, you know, ma the masks will only come off when kids are eating. Once they're done eating, um, if they get up to throw away items, they will be they will be putting their mask back on and, and doing that. And so, again, at all three levels spread throughout spread throughout the building, um, eating lunch six feet apart, which is the most important thing. At the middle school and high school, we will be doing pre-orders. Um, those will continue at the middle school and high school. And oftentimes those, those pre-orders will be um, delivered at a certain location within the building where kids will go and pick those up. Um, the lines will be open in both of those, both of the middle school and high school as well for those that are going through the line. Um, um, but again, we will be focusing on making sure everyone is six feet apart as it, as it relates to lunch. We head on to the next slide. Um, all the buildings will also be talking to you about those for parents that wish to, to pick up their children um, and leave for lunch. There'll be protocols in place um, to do that at each individual building. And then, as you know, um, being in hybrid here throughout the year, um, our drinking fountains have been turned off and, and or covered up from use, but we are we do have bottle fillers in many of our buildings and just really encouraging students to, to bring their own water bottle um, so they, they can be drinking water throughout the day since those fountains um, will not be available. Uh, transportation, let's talk a little bit about transportation. So, um, you know, the buses will be running to all, to all of our buildings. Um, many people have been using the bus throughout the year, but if you have not been and you are eligible in grades K through eight to use the bus, um, we'd encourage you to, <coughs> excuse me, to email schoolbusquestions at uaschools.org um, so they can make sure that you're accounted for. Um, the mask will be required for students as, as, as they're riding on the bus, you know, as weather permits, we'll be opening windows throughout the bus. You know, once we get a good feel of how many kids are riding the bus, you know, we'll be assigning seats when possible and keeping families together in seats when possible. Um, and, and, and 
putting two to three people in a seat um, as allowed by the state for transporting kids. And so um, each bus will be sanitized um, after each route and at the end of each day. And our drivers also will be will be wearing masks. So um, transportation service will continue and, and we expect a lot more riders as we go back to all in. Our general cleaning procedures, you know, really, really aren't going to change. Um, you know, all of those high touched areas will continue to be cleaned um, throughout the day um, by our custodians as well as um, help from, from our staff as they're spraying down things, for example, like after lunch and giving an opportunity in between class exchanges as well for, for desks to be sprayed down. Um, with the amount of time in between class changes that's been increased by the, by the middle school and high school um, since we started hybrid, that will allow time for, for our disinfectant to, to take hold. In addition, um, all of our buildings have been equipped with whether it be foggers or misters, so we can quickly get into areas and, and clean spaces, much like you've seen perhaps at athletic events with our athletic directors. Um, and then, you know, our restrooms and other high touched areas will continue to be uh, cleaned throughout the day. And then of course our evening custodians will, will work hard um, disinfecting and cleaning areas that are used by students every day. And finally here, as we go to the last slide on on our general um, environmental controls and ventilation. Um, you know, since the beginning of the year, we have, we have um, programmed all of our air handlers to run 24 seven, so they're not shutting down. And, you know, every place possible, bringing in the maximum amount of, of outside air as recommended by the CDC. Um, in addition, um, our, our filters have been changed on a more frequent basis this year. And we're, you know, using, using the filters that are recommended uh, by the CDC, which in our case that fit our that fit our um, our units are these MERV eight filters and MERV thirteen filters. Um, one additional thing, or actually two additional things that that we've added as we return back to all in, um, is air purifiers in our larger common spaces, especially where dining is going to occur occur in 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 some of our buildings, um, and then moving to um, this new uh, PHI units for our HVAC systems in all the schools, um, except for the high school in Windermere, which are going to be torn down. We'll be, we'll, we'll be relying on those purifiers in those, in those buildings, as well as the other measures. Um, but using this, this UV light um, within our HVAC systems um, as, a, as a safe way to kill a virus and bacteria um, before it's pushed out into, into our buildings. And so, as you know, a lot of our buildings are newer with newer systems. And so um, we're really focusing on, on this um, photo hydro ionization units that are being installed in our HVAC systems, um, you know, um, here in the coming weeks. And so, um, you know, we'll continue to evaluate our, our HVAC systems as, as the year goes on. Um, but we're really feeling good about the measures that we've put in place that really align with um, what's being recommended to us by the CDC as it relates to environmental controls and ventilation. So, um, Paul? Well, I want to, um, I want to yeah, thank Max Chris for, uh, that'd be great. Yep. I want to, I want to thank you, Chris, for going over all those uh, safety protocols and, and mitigating factors. And thanks to you and your team for doing an outstanding job to uh, keep our students and staff safe inside our schools. And I think you get bonus points for trying to pronounce photohydroionization tonight uh, on a live webinar. So that was impressive. Um, I want to take a moment and talk to the community right now before we get into Q&A, because we want to allow as much time as possible for those of you attending tonight to ask your questions. Um, please make sure you're getting those into the chat because we've covered um, quarantine. Uh, Paul, Dr. Imhoff gave an update on that. And then Chris obviously gave the update just now on the safety and mitigating factors. So what, we, what I wanna take a moment here and talk about is this is the fourth time this school year that we've had our online academy, or, or I should say our school pathway window open. And um, I wanna just uh, throw out the final considerations because we truly do appreciate um, that this, uh, for, for many folks, is a challenging decision. Um, we, that is also why we extended our deadline to tomorrow morning. Um, we wanted you to have as much information as you possibly could as you make this decision so that you feel comfortable uh, as a family making the, this, uh, what I truly do appreciate, I'm a parent myself, uh, is a tough decision. If, you are if you're currently in the, the school-based pathway, which is hybrid, 
and that will shift to all in on March 1st, and you're considering a shift to the online academy. Just want to make some things very clear that um, the online academy is monitored and supported by Upper Arlington teachers. However, with few exceptions at the K through five level, the online academy provides support and review sessions. It is not live classes or instruction. It's not going to feel like enhanced distance learning. Again, we have some of that feel a couple times a week for our youngest learners, but it is basically a working at your own pace, independent learning. Students can work ahead at their own pace, but they've got to maintain adequate progress. Um, the, for any student leaving the school-based pathway and considering and joining the online academy, we've had a lot of questions about the pacing and the content. And we have the ability and our teachers will do the best they can and they do a great job of this to align the content about where your child would be exiting the school based uh, pacing and giving them an entry point into the curriculum at about where they were. It might not be perfect, but we will get it as close as we possibly can. But please understand that the pacing will be different. Um, in the K through five, I wanna talk to those parents right now because just if you are considering a shift at this stage of the school year, please know that um, parents take on a significant role as a learning partner with, with us, with the teachers and with their children. Uh, as learning partners um, in the online academy. In six through 12, students uh, work independently with support through office hours and communication with a teacher. Core subjects do have content teacher, uh, a teacher aligned to that subject. The electives have teachers as monitors and you might be getting support from a teacher who is there to support and, and build a relationship with your student in that elective, but might not have that content expertise. Also, uh, students in the secondary realm, if you will not be guaranteed the electives you currently have in the school building, okay? So if you shift to the online academy, all your classes to the online academy, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment, you, will, you might not be guaranteed having the same electives, but we will make sure that you get credit for this third quarter, and I will talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, some academic considerations as we wrap up this particular slide, if you're considering leaving the online academy to go to the school-based pathway, and we already know we have some families considering that, um, please know that we are going to um, schedule what we can and schedule uh, with a priority of kindergarten, first grade, and seniors, as I've previously stated. Please remember that the commitment made either at the beginning of the year or the semester was for uh, the remainder of this particular school year. Um, Generally speaking, students in the online academy have been able to work ahead at their own pace, which also means that the content pacing will very likely not be aligned for students returning uh, to the school-based pathway. In fact, just to be clear, it will not be aligned in uh, many, of those, many of those cases. So just wanted to be clear about those uh, points if you are considering a shift in your pathway. And, and Andy, before you move on to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about timing because we've received more than a few questions about making a decision by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning uh, and why we can't allow more time. So let's go ahead and address that at this point, if you could. Sure. So um, again, that is a great question. And if uh, just to recall the previous windows that we've had, we've had much more time in terms of to, to make these uh, shifts because what happens in the background when we make these changes is that we have to look at staffing we have to plug students into the, their new systems, uh, whether it's the online platforms, whether it is scheduling them into their, their school-based pathways. It is some level of orientation for those kids, those families. It is to make sure that um, PowerSchool, Canvas, and Seesaw are set up and ready to go on day one. Um, but you know, quite frankly, outside of those orientation pieces, depending on the numbers that shift, uh, it is an imp it can be an impact on staffing because we have to be very mindful of our um, teachers, intervention specialists, our support staff that work with all of these children in both pathways uh, to make sure that we maintain reasonable um, numbers. Uh, Dr. Imhoff, is it good if I go on to the good? next slide there? Yep, okay. next slide. Thanks a lot. All right. Um, the, uh, the learning pathway uh, request, as we talked about, uh, the deadline has been extended to 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Um, 
please, if you want to be considered for this March 1st start date in, in a pathway change, that does need to be completed by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Um, we will do everything we can to notify you by this Thursday. Uh, again, that could depend on numbers, but if the numbers are about where they are, we feel confident that we can get this turned around by Thursday so we can have some level of welcome and orientation by Friday. Um, any requests that are granted, this is a very important point, will be for the remainder of the school year. They will be for the remainder of the school year. Having said that, I want to be very clear too. We understand that at times family circumstances can change. Uh, perhaps a, a, someone of the vulnerable population moves in with the family or some, some kind of circumstance that is, uh, deals with life safety happens. We will process those requests. But just to be clear, uh, these changes that take place right now will take effect on March 1st. We've also had a lot of questions about could we wait until March 23rd? Could we wait until two weeks after spring break? And while I understand and appreciate those questions, the, these changes for the reasons that I explained a moment ago need to take place now and need to remain for the remainder of the school year. Um, I think when we get into questions, we are going to be able to get into some more uh, around learning pathway decisions that um, are out there. So Dr. Imhoff, I'll kick it back over to you yep. uh, as yep. we ease into the Q&A. Okay, so we've got a half an hour for questions. So um, keep, uh, keep typing your questions in there. Also, just a reminder, we have a high school webinar at 715. Uh, so you have another opportunity uh, to learn more about the high school at that point. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the first question. Andy, this is gonna go to you. It's about learning pathways. What options does an IB diploma student, senior, have for online? If the, if the only option is to stay in school, can they work from home until community cases drop without penalty? and with connection to a teacher. Okay, a couple of things I wanna say here about this because this has been one of the top questions, but I think it can also pertain potentially, um, actually, should I stop share on the screen? Sorry, just a little protocol thing here. Yeah, why don't you do that? <laughs> that That's good. Okay. Um, the, uh, the first answer to answer this specific question is for students moving into the online academy, we're going to be working through situations like this case by case. Um, you're going to want to stay tuned. Please come over to the, the webinar at 715. Um, but we will make this work for that student schedule. So whether a course, be it IB or something else, is not offered, we, we feel that we need to find a way forward for that student. The other thing that I want to um, make very clear is that it, it does not have to be an all or nothing. If you are currently in the hybrid model, which goes all in on March 1st, and you, uh, you don't have to shift all of the courses over to the online academy. If you want to keep a course or two and mitigate risk by only attending a course that might not be offered in the online academy, you, the student can continue to attend in-person learning for one or two classes. And then the remainder of those courses can be uh, engaged within the online academy. So more to come. We understand the, the, the difficult decision some of those families have to make, but we feel that we need to make it work case by case. Thanks a lot, Andy. So again, this is one of the, I think one of the most uh, common questions we're getting. So just to reiterate one more time, I'm a high school student. I wanna go fully to the online academy. I'm worried that some of my courses are not offered in the, in the online academy. We will find a way to make that work for you. And we will do that on an individual basis. And so just wanted to be clear on that. Uh, the next question uh, is again uh, about physical distancing. Why is the Board of Education not recommending and the district planning for buildings like Wycliffe that have the space to maintain six feet of distance do so by spreading students out so that one class fills two adjoining classrooms and relocating displaced classes for the, duration, for the duration of in-person learning to neighborhoods, cafeteria, music room, library, et cetera. And the reality is none of our buildings, even the new Wycliffe, have enough room uh, to have all the students uh, in session and maintain six feet of distancing. Uh, the next question uh, goes to Andy again about learning pathways. What percentage of students are signed up to attend in person? Does this vary by building type, elementary versus middle versus high school? Sure. So actually working backwards here, it actually it absolutely does vary by building. Um, it has all year long. 
for, since the beginning of the year, we've had anywhere between eight and 900 students in our online academy. Um, so anyone could run the numbers there in terms of the percentage, but it does vary building to building. Uh, and right now we are tracking in real time how many students are requesting to join the online academy and how many students are requesting to leave the school-based pathway, as well as um, which students are asking for a little bit of a, uh, a blend of both of those approaches. Okay. The next question, and we have a number of quarantine questions coming, and I'm going to take them in the order they're listed here. Uh, one of the first is uh, quarantine protocols upon returning from spring break if families choose to travel. Uh, so what are they? And so, um, first of all, uh, we do not have the power to enforce uh, any of the guidelines around travel uh, and quarantining. But you're gonna be hearing us talk about these in Friday updates and in my videos. And we are going to be doing everything in our power to encourage our families to make the right choice. Um, and so as, as a reminder, the travel advisories for the state of Ohio uh, call for 14 days of self-quarantine if a person has traveled to any state that is reporting positivity rates of 15% or higher. And the state is constantly updating a list of those states. So again, uh, we will be talking about that in our weekly updates. And we want parents, we want families to follow that uh, for, for the safety of everyone uh, and so we can keep as many kids in school as possible. But, and I've received this question a number of times, we do not have the power uh, to enforce that. Okay. So Chris, this is gonna go to you. This is health and safety protocols. Can you share uh, what additional measures schools are taking because of changing uh, from six feet uh, to less distancing? Uh, well, as the medical team advises us, the, the most important things that we can do, um, no matter what the distance is, to wear our masks appropriately and the hand hygiene. Um, so continue to use the hand sanitizer that is located throughout every building and in every classroom, making sure that our masks are worn properly and at all times, unless we are six feet apart during lunch. Um, and then in addition, some of those HVAC things that I mentioned earlier, um, by using the UV, the UV system safely within our HVAC units, as well as some portable units um, in some large areas where we're eating lunch. But again, the hand hygiene and the masks are, are, are the most important thing, um, whether, whether you're in the school building or any other place um, to, to prevent the spread of COVID. And Chris, I'm gonna add a question that's not on here. I'd like you to talk uh, for a moment I know members of our medical advisory team have been touring the buildings with you uh, just to inspect our different uh, safety protocols. I just wondered if you could let everyone know watching uh, how those visits have gone and what you've learned from members of the medical team as they visited our buildings and learned more about our safety protocols for all in. Yeah, so we, so far, um, um, we have visited every building except Tremont and Barrington, which we're doing on Wednesday um, with members of our medical team. Um, and they have been really impressed by the, the amount of work that's been done um, by our principals and the planning and logistics um, by our principals, but more importantly, impressed um, by the compliance of our students and staff um, with the items that we have in place. Um, you know, the, certainly the area of lunch is, is one of the most important areas for them and keeping that six feet um, and in walking through the buildings that we have walked through so far and listening to the principals spell out the plan of how lunch is going to be um, served and, and eaten throughout the building um, six feet apart um, when those masks are off. Um, the medical advisory team um, is feeling really encouraged by, by all those protocols that we have in place and the compliance that's happening with them. Of course, with anything, you know, as we come all back in, uh, we will continue to monitor how everything is going. And if there are adjustments that can be made, we're, we, we are going to make them. Um, and we'll continue to get the advice of our medical team um, about those adjustments before making them. Okay, Chris, thanks a lot. Uh, the next question uh, comes to me about end of year celebrations. Are you still considering a ceremony or event of some kind for the class of 2020? Uh, this summer is previously considered. And Mr. Theato is working with and will continue to work with representatives from the class of 2020. Uh, and if the class of 2020 wants a ceremony, then we're gonna have a ceremony. Uh, and so we have promised that to them, but we'll let the kids make that decision. Well, 
guess they're not kids anymore. Uh, they've most of them are completing their freshman year of college, but uh, we will let the class of 2020 and their representatives uh, make that call. And we will look forward to whatever their decision is. Uh, the next question for me on quarantine guidelines, who and how is it determined that you had a close exposure? So what I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna read, uh, this is the current guidance uh, from Franklin County Public Health uh, about what a close exposure, or as they call it, a close contact is. Quote, a close contact is anyone who was within six feet or less of someone diagnosed with COVID-19 for a total of 15 minutes or more combined total time starting two days before their symptoms began. Uh, and so again, it's someone who is closer than six feet uh, for more than 15 minutes cumulative during the day. That is a close contact uh, as defined by public health. Um, so um, let me see, this is for Andy. I think he already answered this once, but uh, Andy, this is if guidance changes, are we gonna have an opportunity to change into or out of the online academy later in the school year? Uh, no. Um, quite frankly, we, we need to stick with this window right now and March 1st. Um, again, if, if there's an extenuating emergency circumstance that a family has in, that deals with life safety, please reach out to us and we will process that on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Another one about uh, quarantine guidelines for me. What if a student already had COVID? Will they still be quarantined? Uh, if a student has had COVID already, there's a 90-day period uh, that they won't have to quarantine if they're exposed to COVID again. And that's for, for, for everything. They won't have to quarantine for classroom or for extracurriculars or sports. So again, that's a 90-day window. Uh, the next question for me about quarantine. Will the reduced quarantine for sports apply to other extracurriculars such as speech and debate? Uh, yes. So uh, when the state, uh, according to, again, what I learned from the lieutenant governor a bit ago, uh, when the state adopts the new quarantine guidelines, uh, that will apply to all extra c -c 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 curriculars, uh, sports and clubs, et cetera. Uh, another uh, question, please define exposure in the classroom in more detail. Uh, again, exposure in the classroom is defined as being closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes accumulative. Uh, and that includes with a mask on, and there's always a mask on uh, in the classroom. And so uh, that, and that does mean even with a mask on. Uh, another question for quarantine guidelines, if exposed in the classroom, is that an exposure of anyone in the class test positive or do they have to be less than six feet, six, six, six feet from them? So again, let me just, and I know this is confusing. And so I think walking through it a number of times is a good thing. Um, so if I'm a student in a classroom and I test positive, uh, anyone within that classroom who has been closer than six feet to me for 15 minutes or more is considered a close contact, okay? And we, and we send out a notice to parents anytime that, that, that happens, and we will uh, can, can continue to do that. So anyone who tests positive, if you're closer than six feet to them for more than 15 minutes, then you are going to be a close contact and the quarantine protocols are going to apply to, uh, to you. Okay, so the next question for me is about the Board of Education decision. Why was the date of all-in changed to March 1st before spring break and the end of the quarter instead of March 23rd, which corresponds to the beginning of the fourth quarter? Also, why is the deadline uh, for Online Academy only 13 hours after this meeting? Um, and I do want you to know the Board of Education had a lengthy uh, the discussion at their February 12 meeting, which is where they made the decision uh, to go all in on March 1st. Uh, and, that's on our, and that's on our YouTube channel. Uh, the board talked for over two hours. There was a presentation by Dr. Naeem Ali from our, uh, from our medical advisory team. And I would invite uh, anyone who has more questions about that board meeting and, and the decision uh, to visit our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and to learn more about that. As far as timing, uh, again, this is back to the timing. I know we've covered this a number of times already, but I'll just reiterate it. Um, we are giving as much time as, as, as we can for parents to make uh, a, a decision about moving or, uh, into or out of the, the online academy, but we need time to schedule those students who are changing pathways 
so we can be ready for school on Monday. Uh, and so while we would love to give more time, we don't have more time to give. Uh, so we can again have those student schedules ready for them and have them ready to go uh, on Monday. So the next question for me, if it's so safe for us to go back, why aren't you having the meeting in person? Um, and I will tell you, and that is a great question and I certainly appreciate it. Uh, we are having this meeting uh, via Zoom in this webinar because we think it's easier for more parents to actually uh, 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 attend the meeting. I think one of the things that we've learned through the pandemic is when we offer meetings like this, we get more parents who are able to join us. Uh, because we know there are lots of different situations in homes. And our goal is always to have as many parents as possible be able to, 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 to attend our meetings. I um, mean, I'll tell you, I think that the webinars uh, as a way for uh, parents to learn information, um, I think there will be times even after the pandemic that we use this as a tool uh, because we've heard from more than a few parents uh, who have found this an easier way to gather information and engage. But I certainly appreciate the question. Uh, the next question, will we be made aware if someone in our child's classroom tests positive? And the answer is yes. We're going to continue to send a school notification and a classroom notification uh, for any positive cases in our schools, and that follows the current state order. Um, so question for me, uh, why is there a distinction between school exposure versus out-of-school exposure? Um, and the governor has talked about this at length on his press conferences. Uh, the state of Ohio uh, c c c c commissioned a study, um, and, uh, the, and, the, and the results of this study have been shown, um, and the study actually that enabled the state uh, to basically allow this new form of quarantine uh, only studied uh, cases uh, or, you know, or, or exposures in the classroom and, and not in other places. And so that's why the new state guidance uh, only applies to classroom exposures and not exposures in, in, in other places. So that is the answer to that. Uh, will online academy students get to attend non-class academic activities? Dr. Hatton. Yes, uh, those students, just like they have been throughout the year, are still connected to their buildings and we'll continue to receive communication uh, about those uh, extracurricular activities that are, uh, that are occurring in the building. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Chris, this next one is for you. Many European countries are teaching classes outdoors in open spaces to improve social distancing. Can this be a bigger part of our strategy? Uh, absolutely, if you remember back to the fall, uh, we saw a lot of um, staff and teachers taking classes outside um, and and certainly as the weather improves that is something we will want to take advantage of at all our schools um, the opportunity to be outside um, and, and conduct classes that way. Great another question about quarantine guidance for me uh, for high school students uh, and this would be for middle school students too who rotate classes uh, if they're exposed in one class, do they get to go to all classes after that or just the one they, they were exposed in? Uh, and again, according to the state guidance, the students are allowed to continue to attend all of their classes within the school day. Uh, but if they're on quarantine, they, they can't do anything outside of the school day if they've been a close contact, but they can follow their entire schedule during the school day. Next question for me, how many elementary students have had to quarantine so far due to close contact with someone who, 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 who tested positive? Um, I don't have that exact number here with me tonight, uh, but we've certainly had elementary students who've had to quarantine due to exposures at school, but it hasn't been a high number at all. Um, next question for me, is the webinar being, be, being recorded? Uh, yes, it'll, it'll be on our district YouTube channel, so anyone will have the opportunity to watch this later. We'll also make sure we post a link on our website. Uh, Andy, will there be an online academy option uh, in the next school year? Uh, someone's asking in case children won't have vaccines uh, uh, until year end or into next year. Right, and that's a good question. And so, yes, we have anticipated that, and we will have some sort of remote learning option for our K through 12 students uh, for next year. The design of that is still uh, to be determined, um, but it's really going to be impacted by the number of um, students that opt into those courses or um, the, that option. So, more to come on that. Uh, as we approach the end of the school year. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, um, 
Another question for me on quarantine. Can I further explain the updated guideline? Uh, does the guideline, and again, I wanna be clear, uh, I've not gotten the updated guideline yet. This is what the Lieutenant Governor told me was coming. So again, I wanna be clear on that, uh, but I will go through it again. Uh, specifically, does the guideline change the days of quarantine if a positive test or just a close contact? And so let's just walk, uh, walk through this again. Um, if I'm the person who tests positive, uh, that is not called quarantine, that's called isolation. Uh, and that's how public health uh, 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 refers to that, okay? And so again, quoting from public health guidance, a positive COVID-19 case should remain home under isolation for 10 days after symptoms begin and until 24 hours after fever is gone without taking fever reducing medications uh, and so again, uh, if I test positive, I'm on isolation for 10 days. And so what the Lieutenant Governor talked to me about earlier has no impact on if I test positive. It only has an impact on if I'm a close contact of someone who has tested positive. So if I'm a close contact of someone who has tested positive, again, what, uh, uh, what Mr. Hughes said, said uh, is the state is gonna be changing its guidelines to align to what the CDC has, has put out, and you can see this on the CDC site, uh, which is basically, and again, I'm looking uh, directly at their, at, at their guidance. Uh, it is a 10-day quarantine without a test, or you can come back uh, after day seven with a negative test, test, test result, as long as that test result occurred on day five or later. Uh, and again, so that's what, uh, that is the guidance that the Lieutenant Governor said is coming. We do not have that in writing yet from public health, uh, but I'm confident that we'll be getting that. Um, so that answers that. Uh, Chris, let's talk about lunch a little more. Where will students have lunch and how will six feet of distance be maintained in the class or cafeteria while having lunch? Well, lunch will, lunch will be eaten throughout the building in, in all of our schools. Um, and so for example, a, a class a class of, of 20 students, um, 10 may stay in the classroom and 10 may be going to the cafeteria um, to have their lunch six feet apart. Um, so it could be a learning center, it could be in the gym um, where we'll have tables set up six feet apart, um, but throughout the school and all buildings is, is where we'll, we'll be having um, students eat lunch. Okay, great. Uh, next question for me about testing. Are we doing random uh, surveillance testing? Uh, we are not doing it uh, at this time, but we will continue working with our medical advisory team. We've gotten questions about uh, testing, and so we will continue to uh, look into that. Uh, Andy, a question about block scheduling. Will the high school uh, and middle school continue in block scheduling, for, which is four periods a day, or go back to eight periods of classes per day? The block schedule at our middle schools and high schools is going to remain uh, in place for the remainder of this school year. And uh, more details will be coming out from the principals uh, about how the Wednesdays are gonna work, but we will be in block for the remainder of this school year. And what I wanna add to that, and so, you know, and we continue to get a lot of questions uh, on quarantine guidelines uh, and about block schedule, but think about the block schedule through the lens of a quarantine a guideline. So when we get a positive case at the school, um, a student, uh, imagine that they've, been in eight different classrooms throughout the, 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 the day if, if we were on the non-pandemic schedule, for instance, at, at, at the high school, uh, how many close, close contacts could, could have happened throughout that? And by being on the block, it's actually half of the close contacts because they're in four periods instead of eight. And so that certainly cuts down on the close contacts. It cuts down on quarantining. The other thing, uh, and our, our medical team has talked about this, it cuts down on the class changes and the mixing of cohorts as well. So just two really important safety factors that have, that have led us to stay in the block uh, while, while we're in the pandemic. So uh, Chris, uh, we're gonna talk about health and safety protocols. Will the clear shields be reinstalled in first grade at Windermere? My son indicated they were removed, which was not make sense as the students are losing space in the classroom. So the clear shields have been used throughout all of our elementaries um, in grades K through two, and in some cases three. Um, the, the, in 
in discussions with the medical team, the medical team really feels like there's no evidence or data that suggests these shields um, actually are doing something for us. Um, and it also provides another service that a surface that we have to clean um, going forward. And so going forward, those shields are being removed um, on the advice of our medical team um, um, to, to the, uh, the ability of, of, what the, of how they're helping. Okay, thanks, Chris. Andy, about the online academy, what happens if online academy is ahead of in school? Do students have to catch up? Uh, what about courses not offered in the online academy? Yeah, so this is a great question. We get it a lot. And I, as I said earlier, there wouldn't be like a catch up factor. What we're going to do is do our best and our teachers do a great job with this of having the entry point for a student joining the online academy be aligned as closely as possible to where they were in the school based pathway. Now classes not offered in the online academy and I, this would I think primarily be for our six through 12 students. Um, if it's an elective or at the, especially at the high school, if it's a course we don't offer. As we stated earlier, we do feel that at this point in the school year, with only a quarter of the school year left, we are going to figure out a way to try to make it work. Um, because quite frankly, we can't offer something that we don't have in the online academy. So students, um, but there is the option, for example, if it's an elective and the student has done not this third quarter of an elective, and then they want to start an online academy elective because they do not want to go back into the building or maybe the plan we come up with uh, doesn't suffice. We are going to figure out a way to make sure that they get the 0.5, the half credit in the high school for that course uh, to keep everyone moving towards graduation and, and whole with their credits. Because as you know, we award credit at the semester in the high school, but we are, we've been working uh, diligently for some time on making sure that we can have uh, those quarter credits moving forward. Um, okay. It looks like, I think this next so one is talk, for me. Yeah, if you wanna go ahead and take that. Sure, um, can, core, can all core classes be taken online and electives still be taken in school? And the answer is yes. So um, again, if you wanna keep the electives you're in that we don't offer in the online academy and you wanna attend those or if we figure out a solution that works, you can do that. And I'm gonna jump to a question that's coming up here down the page a little bit um, that said uh, something about um, earlier in the year, I, I might have said that it's all or nothing when you schedule into the online academy. Um, and just quite frankly, I don't recall saying that, but just to be very clear, because throughout the year, we've had students taking some, you know, courses in person, some courses in the online academy, um, our homeschool students do the same thing. So we've aligned with our homeschool practices. We have some schools taking homeschool and some students taking online academy courses. Um, so you can create a schedule that uh, fits with uh, where you want to be in terms of you uh, mitigating these decisions right now. Okay. Um, so question about vaccinations. Uh, mm -hmm. So regarding vaccines for staff, how many have chosen to be vaccinated? That's not information we have access to. Obviously, that's a personal medical choice uh, by the member of the staff. But I can tell you anecdotally, um, I believe the overwhelming majority of our staff have taken advantage of the opportunity uh, to be vaccinated. Um, Jacqueline, I'm going to go to you for the next question. How are IEPs being supported uh, in the online academy? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have um, a staff of intervention specialists who have been supporting um, any and all of our students that have IEPs um, that are attending the online academy. And so they meet with those students regularly. They have a specific schedule um, and Zoom schedule that they, they have to be able to provide all of their specially designed instruction minutes um, that is listed in their, their IEP. So um, I'm really proud of that group of inter intervention specialists. They've done a great job um, to mimic what, what is done in the building. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, um, looking here. Chris, we had a question about furniture. Uh, why are there not enough seats, desks for each student in the classroom? Why are students forced to share seats or be forced to share tight table spaces? Well, I'll use, I'll use Jones and Hastings as an example. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, most of those classrooms um, had tables and we moved those tables out um, and used desks that we borrowed from the high school um, in order to keep our social distancing during hybrid. Um, however, those desks now need to go back to the high school. Um, and so we're, we are putting the, the tables back into, into the middle school in this case. 
um, and we just don't have enough desks across the entire district um, because tables have been used um, so much in, in a lot of the schools. Okay, great. Uh, what are the metrics moving forward uh, that will be used to determine whether or not a return to hybrid is needed? Uh, and again, we'll, we'll be walking, we'll be working with our medical advisory team. Uh, we've been meeting with them now twice a week and we look at updated data. And so we will continue to, to rely upon them. Um, the numbers, as we all know, have been going down rapidly, which is great, great news. Uh, and if that were to turn around, and obviously we all hope that that does not happen, uh, we do reserve the right uh, to take that information to the board and for the board to consider uh, if we need to go in the other direction. But again, we're all certainly hoping that that is not going to happen. Um, we are at the seven o'clock hour. And so I just wanted to, we got through uh, most of the questions and certainly most of the themes, uh, but I just wanna thank everyone who took the time to join us uh, this evening. Uh, we will continue to update our website uh, with answers to frequently asked questions. I wanna encourage uh, all of our high school parents who have uh, more, more questions uh, to join us uh, for the high school webinar that's gonna start uh, in about 15 minutes. Uh, for all the parents at the elementary and middle schools, you're going to be see, uh, you're going to be receiving co communications very soon from your building principals about more of the procedures that are going to be used uh, at the elementary schools and middle schools as as we prepare for our transition to all in on March 1st. So again, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I want to thank you for uh, taking the time and continue to reach out to us if you have additional questions. Thanks, and everyone have.